and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of the Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are, you, are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. May the Lord place a blessing on the reading of this word. Amen. Okay, so anyway, to the, on to the topic to today. This month, the end of February, marks, I think, if, I'm not, if I, my numbers are correct, the completion of my second full year as pastor in Hartsdale. And in that time, I've gotten pretty good feedback on my sermons. You know, I know that some people maybe are not happy, but they didn't tell me about it, right? So basically, <laughs> I hear all the good stuff. However, today, I have a feeling this is going to be the least popular sermon because I'm going to talk about politics. Now, wait a minute. Don't worry. I'm not going to talk about one side or the other. I'm not going to critique one side or the other. But I'm going to talk about something that I believe is the rightful domain of the pastor to address. That is, I want to talk today about how we as Christians should engage political issues and how we should treat each other in the process. I'm going to criticize both sides, in other words. And I have a feeling that nobody here is going to be happy with what I'm going to say, at least not at the beginning. Hopefully, hopefully, by the time I reach the end, I will have explained myself clearly enough, and I will have addressed some of the objections that I'm sure are in your mind, that maybe I will have convinced you that what I'm saying is correct. So again, what I want to do today is I want to talk about our method and our attitude when it comes to handling political issues among ourselves and in the wider society. Okay, I want to just start with what's going to sound like a no-brainer, how things are. I don't think it's a shock to anyone to know that the times we live in are probably the most polarized times of any of us who've been alive. I'm an old guy now, even though I don't look it. <laughs> and in all the times that I've been observing politics in the United States, I have never seen the two positions more alienated and antagonistic to each other than they are now. Am I right? Yes. Basically, people have been pushed to the polls. They're convinced that the other side is completely wrong. They're convinced that they have no need at all to listen to what the other side has to say, or even care about what they have to say. We, it almost is, it's almost as if we feel our only responsibility is to hurl insults and accusations and arguments at the other side. Not only that, we feel justified in this. As if the other side, the other viewpoint from ours, whether you're on the left or the right, the other viewpoint from ours doesn't even have a sliver of merit or anything worthwhile to say at all. Right. You know, we are totally convinced that we are right and they are wrong. Right. All you have to do is watch the TV for five minutes or in half that time go on the internet and you'll see what I'm talking about, right? The United States of America has become more partisan and divided than I think any of us are happy with. All you see when you observe the way people relate to each other and to political issues is division and rancor. But here's the problem. Because that's the spirit of the times, I think even we, as Christians, have gotten caught up in the same thing. Mm. Our tendency is to take that same approach. We, uh, we know so certainly that our side is right, that we don't have to listen to anybody else. All we have to do is state our case. I don't think this is good. I think it's plain for all of us to see this problem, but today I want to oppose this. All right? And I want to tell you why. There's two other sources of input that have shaped my idea about this topic and what I want to tell you today. First of all, 
I interact in some settings where I have to hear the other side. Okay? I have to hear what people who have different views from me are saying. And you know what? I was resistant for a long time, I'll be honest with you, to even acknowledge or admit that they might have something valuable to say. But when I finally broke down some of my barriers and I turned into, okay, let me finally listen to what these people on the other side are saying, I learned two things. First of all, my friends who are aligned with a different viewpoint than me do not fit the stereotype of what I want to impose on that other side. You, you follow what I'm saying? We all have a, a, a picture of how that other group is, right? And we want to paint them all with the same brush. We want to assume that they all are in lockstep, uh, you know, believing A, B, C, D. But when I actually started to listen to people who had different viewpoints from me, I found that they, they weren't like that. They didn't fit the stereotype, or at least they, didn't, they weren't consciously affirming some of those stereotypes. Maybe there's some underlying beliefs there that overlap, you know what I mean? But that could be addressed. But anyway, the first point I'm trying to make is, they didn't <laughs> fit the picture that I wanted to impose on them. That each side wants to impose on the other. That's the first thing I noticed. The second thing I noticed, and it took a while, I will tell you, is when I started to listen to the other side, I realized that, you know what, they might be right about this, <laughs> this one thing. I'm not saying I adopted all of their beliefs, I'm not trying to say that. And I'm not suggesting that all of us should all of a sudden let down all of our barriers and just let all ideas flood into our minds. I'm not saying that. But what I am observing in my own life was that when I started to listen, I realized that, you know what, at least on this point, I could agree with them. They might have something valid to say. So that's the first thing that's leading me to develop this idea that I'm about to present to you today. The second thing that moves me to offer a third way, besides just taking sides on the right or taking sides on the left, the second thing that moves me to offer this alternative is the fact that I've been reading the New Testament Gospel. The Gospel that Jesus came into the world to bring groups that were beforehand separated and alienated from each other and bring them into one. Okay, that's an essence, that's an essential facet of the New Testament Gospel. The idea that, as we call them, Jews and Gentiles, or you could say slaves and free, whatever, whatever were the divisions in society back in the day of Jesus and Paul and the other apostles, they were coming together, not separating further apart, right? And, along with that, there's the admonition to love, to make for unity, to be humble, to, to do everything that we possibly can to create harmony rather than conflict. So, these are the sources of my presentation today. This is the platform or vantage point that I'm going to use to make my criticism of what's commonly going on out there. I want to offer a, a better way. I want to suggest that the third way for us as Christians is not to abandon our beliefs. I'm not saying that, and I'll elaborate on that as we go along. But the third way, and I think the truest calling for us as Christians, is to do everything we can to be peacemakers and to develop understanding as far as it is possible. That's what I would like to present to you. Please take a look at Matthew chapter 5, the passage that we just uh, have for the scripture reading. This comes, as you know, from the section of the Gospel of Matthew that's called the Sermon on the Mount. This is where many scholars say Jesus laid out the principles of the Kingdom of Heaven. This was his synthesis, his distillation of all of the values and, and principles that should govern the new age under God's rule, okay? And I think it shows us what is the third way, the Christian way of handling some of these things. Take, we're not going to read every single verse all over again, but let's take a look first at <clears throat> chapter 5, verse 43 to 45. Notice what it says. You have heard that it was said, this is Jesus speaking, remember, he's addressing the common beliefs of the day. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor 
and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. That's the third way. You hear what it says about God? God doesn't allow a person's goodness or badness, whatever their practices or not, whatever their beliefs are or not, God doesn't allow their status and their quality to change what He does. He sends the sunshine and rain to, to bless everyone. Okay? He says, most people think you should love your neighbors. In other words, love the people like you, right? Love the people you agree with and hate your enemy. Jesus says, no, I tell you to love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. So I'm going to ask you, do you have enemies? Yes. <laughs> wow, we have an honest man right in the front row. <laughs> in this context, in the context of political discourse, do we have opponents? So maybe we could call those enemies in the case. Now here's the, the bigger question. Do we love them? Try. <laughs> in the context, here's what I mean by that. When I say, do you love people that differ from you? Does that mean, one, do you give them the benefit of the doubt that maybe they're doing the best that they can? You know what I mean? Even though we disagree, can we at least give them the benefit of the doubt that maybe they see things differently and they're trying to find what they think is really the right thing to do? Now, I'm not saying everybody. There are some whacked out people there, right? I'm not saying that we have to agree with everybody or condone every action of people on the, the far ends of either side. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying for the normal run-of-the-mill person who maybe happens to be a Democrat or happens to be a Republican or an Independent or whatever, even if we disagree, can we at least give them the benefit of the doubt that they might be doing, they might have some shred of value to what they're doing? Can we include them as human beings, you know, back into the race of human beings? Or are they some kind of alien to us? This is what I'm saying. By loving them, is it possible that we might actually listen to what they're saying? And go a step further, listen to what they're saying with the intention to at least understand, even if we don't agree. When Jesus says, love your enemies and those who persecute you, I'm applying it now to this issue that we're dealing with in the country. Maybe it means at least that. At least that. Breaking down the caricature. Stop labeling the other person as a bad and evil enemy. Although some may be, I'm not denying that. And at least, at least, give them the benefit of the doubt and listen enough to hear what they have to say. This is what I'm saying. I'm thinking of now some objections that are going to come up. Some people will say, this is no time to make peace because there's too much at stake. This is the time to fight, people might say. As a matter of fact, the world is in turmoil. All in many of the Western countries, there's big shifts in the political landscape, reactionary shifts. So it's true, I would agree, there is a lot at stake. And I would also agree that we have to fight. But here's what I'm saying. I think we need to make clear, rational decisions about how we fight and what we're fighting for. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. A lot is at stake. The question is not that we should sit back and just relax and say, okay, I don't let anything happy happen, God will take care of it. No. There's a lot at stake. We need to act. We need to fight. But how? And I'm saying we need to learn how to fight like Christians. We need to learn how to... Uh, uh, inject ourselves into the political process in a gracious manner with the intention to understand the other group, the other side. I'm saying that we have to fight not against other persons, not even other, against other groups. We need to fight primarily against the spirit of divisiveness that has taken hold of the country in the last 30 years. And it's been building and building and building until, like I said, the two groups are at opposite ends of the extreme and throwing darts at each other. I don't know how many of you guys 
uh, men mostly, maybe women too, used to play dodgeball. You remember dodgeball? There were two kinds of dodgeball when I was a kid. There was running dodgeball, you remember what that was? Where everybody was just, it was a free-for-all in, inside of a gym, and you could just run around and anybody could throw at anybody. But then there was line dodgeball, right? Line dodgeball in which there was like five or six people on one end, on one side of a line, five or six people on the other, and it was usually like a soccer ball or a volleyball or something like that. And that's, they were throwing the ball at each other. That's what it's become in the United States. I think that illustration is, is a perfect representation of where we're at in the country. And what I'm saying is, yes, we have to fight. The first thing we have to fight is this spirit of division that breaks us down and separates us and makes us feel like the other person is almost non-human. The other thing we need to fight, we need to fight to build understanding, to listen. We're not going to agree. But just think, if we listen to people on the other side and they, they, they feel like we, they've been heard, maybe some of that tension and anxiety and anger will subside to the point where we can actually discuss possible solutions to things. That's what I'm saying. This is what I call the third way. Now let me use another illustration. You guys have heard me say this before. I don't watch much TV, but I watch Jeopardy, right? <laughs> and um, I'm pretty good at a lot of categories in Jeopardy, not all. I know nothing about pop music, nothing about television, and nothing about movies, right? So sometimes I imagine if I was going to compete in Jeopardy, I would like maybe some of my, my brothers to be with me because they know about that stuff. You know, so that instead of just one mind, right, trying to cover all the range of topics in Jeopardy, we, would, we could kind of pool our brains together, you know what I mean? Like we could have, like, what do they call that, crowdsourcing, right? Isn't that the idea now? Where you pull all different perspectives in and focuses on one thing. How about we aim for that in political conversation? Instead of just writing off the other person, the other group, dismissing everything they have to say, why don't we use it, like, why don't we take the opportunity to, to act as if we're on the same side looking at a common problem? with different vantage points and different point uh, analyses. That's what I'm saying. And again, remember, I'm not saying we have to agree. I'm not saying that. I'm saying, can we at least listen? Right? Or are we not, are we not even willing, this is a question to you, are you not even willing to admit that maybe the other side has something to say? Whichever side you're on. Notice I didn't say which side I'm on. You might... So that's why I figured I'm offending everybody here, right? Because everybody's probably thinking I'm accusing their side. I'm just asking, can we at least acknowledge that maybe there's some value in what the other person has to say? I'm not saying we sacrifice our position. I'm saying we should understand and try to build peace. This is what I call the third way. It's the way of Christ, I think. The way of making peace as far as possible. It doesn't mean we give up our views, get this. By making peace and listening, it doesn't mean we give up our positions. It means we give up our animosity. We give up our hostility and uh, closed-mindedness. That's what I'm saying. It doesn't mean we should just sit back and be quiet. No, it means we should speak, but speak as Christians. Speak in such a way that the other person feels like they've been heard. What do you think about that? Because guess what? If the other person feels like we've heard them, then what does that mean? Then maybe we have a hearing too. Maybe they would hear us too. That's what I'm saying. This is the image I have in mind. Are you getting it? It's a different approach. That's why I call it the third way. I'm not talking about policy. Notice I have said nothing about policy. I'm just talking about method. I'm talking about how we should act as Christians when it comes to political discussion and debate. Go back to Matthew chapter 5. If you, There's some other interesting verses earlier in the chapter. They're called the Beatitudes. You've heard of that? Yeah. Beatitude, I think, is a Latin. It comes to us from Latin. It means blessing. This is, this is the way of blessing. Jesus said this. See if you can find these verses. Listen carefully. Blessed are the critics and the revolutionaries. Because God will commend them for their self-righteousness. See that one? No. How about this one? Blessed are you when you hurl clever rebukes at those you disagree with 
Because God will approve your sarcasm. You see that there? How about this one? Blessed are you when you close your mind to other points of view, because God loves the rigid and their stubborn opinions. <laughs> no. You see that? But, but tell me, and I didn't have this in my notes, but tell me honestly, isn't this how we feel now? Isn't this how we feel? Like this is really the great way for us to be now? You know what it says in there? It says, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. It says, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. And then the one that fits, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be what? Called the children of God. That's what I'm saying. There's a third way. Now, you might still feel resistance, I know. And I think it's because we've forgotten our role in this world. We've gotten caught up in the partisanship. And I will admit, again, I have, I'm on a side, I'm on a certain side. I'm not giving up my positions here. I'm not saying that. I'm saying we should fight against the polarization. We should fight against the tendency to impose characters on the others. Right. Now, you know what? It's harder for you to hear this message today than it is for me to preach it, because I've been thinking about it for weeks. And I've had time to sort of break down some of those barriers in my own mind. And like I said, I've had time to actually go and experience it with friends of mine and say, hey, that's not what I thought you meant, you know? And I'm convinced. I'm convinced that I'm right. You've never heard me say that before, I don't think. But I'm convinced that this way that I'm presenting today is the way we should do it. The rest of the world can fight. But as Christians, we need to inject ourselves in such a way that we build bridges and make peace as far as possible. We can still disagree, but at least we can listen. So I'm proposing a new way. I'm proposing a method in which we respect the other person. We listen to them. We under try to understand what they're saying. And as far as possible, we build bridges. And again, I'm not talking. There are some whacked out crazy people out there. I'm not saying we should condone everything and every extreme. I'm not saying that. But I don't think the bulk of the American public are like that. I think most of us are somewhere closer to the middle and reasonable. And I'm saying that as Christians, we should try to be the ones to start that. When Jesus says, uh, it's back in the original, in, in King James it says, you should pray for your enemies and do good to those who despitefully use you. You know that? So do we get an exemption? Because we are because our political position is right? Does that exempt us from this? No. You know what I mean? But we sit we act like it. Right? We act like it. That's because we're so right and we're so convinced that our side has all justice on its side that we don't care how we act. I think this is wrong. Let me address one last objection that might be in your minds, and uh, then I'll move on to finish this up. What about the Old Testament prophets, you might be saying? They spoke out. They were critical. They did what we call spoke truth to power. Have you heard that expression? <laughs> yeah, they did. But they were prophets operating within a certain system. They were in a certain position of power, and they were speaking to kings. We're not doing that. What we're doing is hurling insults and sarcasm at each other. There's a difference there. There will be a time when we have to speak truth to power, individually and collectively, but I, most of what goes on now is not that. It's just one side offending the other. And I say, I'm saying that's not helping anything. So today I'm offering a method. Next time when I'm here in two weeks, I want to offer a theory of how Christians should relate to this, the nation and to civic affairs. Today I'm just proposing a way that we act. I call it the third way. I call it the Christian way. I didn't take sides deliberately because this message applies to both sides. I'm here to criticize both sides. And I'm here to propose a new way, a way of understanding as far as possible. And if we still resist against this, if you're still not convinced after all this time, it's because we as a nation have been played. We've been fooled. 
we've been fooled into thinking that the right way is to be divided and polarized. Right. And if we have already agreed to that, then like the old saying says, we've already been conquered.